Today is Wednesday, August 7th, 2019, and we're about halfway through human action. This is chapter 18, and uh, it's been a couple weeks, I think, since mm -hmm. we've been back. Action in the passing of time. Shall we go through the questions? So I guess we're going to do like two days in a row of this, right? We'll meet again tomorrow. We'll try yeah. and if we don't finish 18 today. Right. Which we probably won't because there's a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. All right. Perspective in the valuation of time. Why are the period of production and the duration of serviceableness categories of human action? Because um, humans have different time preference, I believe. And, you know, one human will, you know, value something, like, will have a lower time preference than others. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Why does every choice imply a choice of period of provision? So, if, if you waited longer, um, then you could probably have more of a good, because this technology and, like, the of producing gets better um, than um, then you'll get more of the good I believe yeah that makes sense there's an experiment they did with children where if you give you can have one marshmallow right now yeah and um, you can just have it or if you wait 15 minutes and let it sit on the table you can have two marshmallows oh that's interesting yeah and the kids who they did a follow-up study like the kids who waited and took two marshmallows later ended up way wealthier later <laughs> in life because it's like same for one is the same for everything like if you can have a low time preference and realize that you're gonna get more later by holding off and you, you have the patience to do it then mm you can end up with more. Wow, that's a fun experiment. <laughs> yeah. What are the methods for lengthening period of provision? Lengthening the period of provision, meaning the amount of time when you can deliver a thing? Uh, that's a good question. Say maybe like producing more of it? Um, the working time plus maturing time is period of pr production. Mm -hmm. The duration of serviceableness measures the length of time for which a given action yields an increment in want satisfaction, and the period of provision is the portion of the future that an actor seeks to influence. So what are the methods for lengthening the period of provision? Um, well, you can lengthen the period of production, producing more yield. Mm -hmm. Right. So if if you can wait longer, the productivity of labor and other natural resources can be multiplied. That makes sense. Yep. What does the choice of a longer period of production imply? A, a longer period of provision, I would think. The two right. are corollary. time preference as an essential requisite of action. Which undeniable, undeniable fact provides the basis for the concept of pri time preference? Uh, that you consume anything at all. Mm -hmm. and the fact that when you consume anything means you prefer that sip of, you know, whatever to uh, having a lot more of it later. Like, you could always just not have anything. But even the man who eats, like, lives on subsistence living and he's totally wealthy is consuming something at that period, which means he, he, he wants to live. Mm -hmm. What is the praxeological distinction between capital and income? Um, capital is accumulated income that's not spent. Mm -hmm. Comment. We must conceive that a man who does not prefer satisfaction within a nearer period would never achieve consumption and enjoyment at all. Yeah. 
people prefer con um, satisfaction now, nearer. Hmm. Interesting. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because we died. We need it now. Uh, capital goods. What is the role of saving? Um, I don't know what it would say in the book. I'd say in order to accumulate capital to deploy it for later, greater things. That's not very good. Um, sure, yeah. I'd say, yeah, the role of saving yeah. is, um, you know, withholding consumption for the benefit of enjoyment later, for right. a later time. And if you are really good at saving, you can become a capitalist and save up enough for equipment and then not use it and let other people use it and then they can give you money and you can just keep going. Mm -hmm. So the more you can um, hold off on enjoyment now, the more you can get later, presumably. How does time preference restrict the amount of saving and investment? Well, at some point you have to use what you've got. Right. Comment. We are better off than earlier generations because we are equipped with the capital goods they have accumulated for us. Yeah. I loved that. How he broke it down. How, like, we only have the machinery that we have because someone somewhere along the line made a net for catching fish. Mm -hmm. And, like, took care of that net and didn't just use it and use it until it was destroyed, but, like, saved some fish, saved some things aside. Right save some money, and then, like, that became the capital equipment that we enjoy today. Mm -hmm. Which is amazing. It didn't come from yesterday. It came from, like, all yeah. the way back. I'm, I'm reading uh, Atlas Shrugged 2 right now. Oh, yeah? And I just got to the part where they're at um, Jim Taggart's wedding party, and Francisco D'Anconio mm. gives his speech about money. Oh, the money speech. Oh, yeah. it's so good. Yeah, and then so he talks about, you know, you shouldn't feel guilty for having money or money isn't the root of evil. And it's like, uh, you know, they talk about inheritance too. Like anyone who, like, like if a fool inherits a bunch of money, he's just going to lose it anyway. And he really talked about, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, kind of like what Mises was saying. And we all are. Oh, man, that's so good. Yeah, money's not the root of all evil, it's the root of all good. Mm. Ugh. What a great book. Why did economists err in classifying capital as independent factors of production? As an independent factor of production. Um, perhaps he's being nitpicky here and saying that um, cap capital, all factors of production are capital in some regard, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know exactly the check. Capital goods are not only fixed equipment such as tools, buildings, and machinery, but also goods in process such as flour destined to become bread and crude oil destined to become gasoline. So, capital is not simply an independent factor of production. Mm -hmm. Presumably, it's all the things that go into production are capital. I guess labor is not really. Well, I mean, I guess, I mean, human capital is a phrase. Oh, yeah, know. that's true. Explain why the difference between the price of capital good and the sum of the prices of complementary or original factors of production required for its reproduction is entirely due to time preference. Right, so if you had all the ingredients, let's say, to make a smoothie versus just buying a smoothie right now, the only difference would be the process of actually doing it, where you can have a smoothie right now. Right. And I'm always willing to pay more to the fresh press. 
for making me a smoothie rather than going and getting all the ingredients and making it myself. Right. It would be so. It would cost so much more money, even though the individual ingredients wouldn't, because it would be my time. Right. It'd be, you'd have to stop what you were doing. Yeah. Oh man. Period of production, waiting time, and period of provision. What is the Austrian point of view with regard to technological knowledge and its role in the production process? What is the Austrian point of view with regard to technical knowledge and its role in the production process? Uh-huh. The above considerations apply for a given state of technical knowledge. It is true that a new invention or discovery may also allow an increase in output per unit of input, even without incurring additional production time. Even so, once the entire structure of production has adjusted to the discovery of new techniques, it will then still be true that further improvements in productivity could be achieved if people were willing to postpone gratification by waiting longer for the finished goods. So, technical knowledge speeds up the amount of time between the uh, period of production and the period of provision. Mm -hmm. But even so, if one firm has greater technical knowledge and speeds everything up, everyone else is going to catch up eventually anyway. We right. have to improve that technical knowledge again. How did foreign capital help poorer nations? Oh, this was great. Because they don't, so the same as we don't have to go make nets and fish and get all the way up to the capital that we're at today, so do nations who are just like, oh, we, we want to be capitalists too. And it's like, great, here's a bunch of capital that they didn't have to work for or get, you know, do anything special mm -hmm. for. But it's, it's now accessible to them. We have abundance at other parts of the world that they get to benefit from, even though they, have, they share no history in, in producing it. Right. So does that, does that help them? Yeah. Yeah, immensely. Uh, but better than them having to start from scratch. Is, but couldn't, wouldn't you say that there's value in starting from scratch? No. I don't know, base knowledge? Like a stronger foundation of like, for instance, maybe, maybe because, you know, they instantly um, get cell phone technology. Yeah. But who's this? Like maybe that they're on the path to something better than cell phones. And sure, I, I mean, I was born with a computer in the house. Yeah. I didn't have to make silicone chips and right. and transistors and you know like. I benefit from the people who came before me, and in a way, I'm foreign to the people of the past. Yeah. Okay. There's no That's difference. Kind of a dumb thought. <laughs> yeah, there's no difference between you know me being born with a computer and the people in the third world mm -hmm. suddenly getting cell phones. Yeah. We're, we're, it's it's much better. Uh, how does the supply of I do see your point though. I mean, I I see a, a point in like. Some people value a pristine, untouched culture that's like frozen in time, but I, yeah. I, I don't value that. I see those like African nations where people are hunting with sticks and it looks like something that's really bad. <laughs> um, how does the supply of capital determine the standard of living? Uh, Venezuela, when you have a lot of capital, you have, can have a really high standard of living, like Venezuela in the early 90s. And when you squander all your capital... Well, Venezuela still has a lot of oil. They still have a lot of capital. That's a good point. But it's, um... 
Isn't it owned by the state and they sell it for like a dollar a tank or something? Like you can fill up your tank for it. Right, but there's still that supply of capital. Right. Okay. Well, to the degree that uh, Venezuelans use oil, their standard of living is quite high. <laughs> but uh, everything else is, seems to be pretty low. Um, yeah, so that's a good point. Supply of capital uh, determines the standard of living. But not for all things, I guess. I mean, it should. I guess it's different when there's a state involved. Yeah. I would say just generally, the more capital you've got, the better your standard of living is going to be. Yeah, presumably. Unless you have really, really low time preference. <laughs> and you just have all of this capital and you live in a hut. Right. You have a billion dollars in the bank and you, you live in a hut. Yeah. Because that billion dollars is going to be worth a lot more. Yeah. In the future, and yeah. You, you have a low time preference. You really know? low time <laughs> preference. Oh, man. The convertibility of capital goods. Why must capital always be in the form of definite capital goods? All capital is embodied in physical capital goods. There is not some idealized abstract capital, some that does not refer to actual capital goods. When a businessman speaks of his total capital, he he means that the likely sum of money he could fetch were he to sell all his capital goods and pay off all his debts associated with a particular enterprise. Why can't there be free capital? What do they mean by free? No. Even cash is not completely free form of capital. The owner of cash is also making a judgment about the future market conditions. He is not out of the market. The purchasing power of money could change violently, for example, making the owner regret his investment in a particular vehicle. Right, so there's no fixed anchor. Everything like is really... Stephen was feeling with Raven. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. Six, the influence of the past upon action. When does it make economic sense to replace an old machine with a new one? When, I guess, the investment in the new machine is equal to or less than the output the, the greater output of the new machine. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Put another way, the new machine produces more than the cost um, of, of acquiring the new machine. Yeah. And I thought this was an amazing point. Maybe it's obvious to other people, but to me, it made the point of, well, why don't we just... Um, upgrade to these new machines. And I was thinking of like o Ocasio or Cortez or whatever, they, and the people who are like, Green New Deal, we gotta get new machines because they're so much better. And it's like, yeah, they're better. There's a lot of things that are better. We can't automatically switch over to everything that's better because it doesn't make economic sense. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of machines that still run great, and getting rid of them causes more destruction and that You've got perfectly good equipment that could be used to satisfy the wants and needs of the people today, and as those wear out, as they inevitably will, then they'll be replaced with the better technology. Mm -hmm. But you can't just switch over right away. Right. That point really hit home for me. Why are technological backwardness and economic inferiority two different things? Well, presumably a economy could be 
superior despite being technologically backward. Um, supposing it were free, uh, for example, um, I would think Tai, uh, what is it, Hong Kong and China, yeah. where um, at one point Hong Kong accounted for something like 25% of China and Hong Kong's um, economic production, mm -hmm. and today it represents about 3%. Um, Hong Kong was both economically superior and um, technologically advanced, and China was economically inferior and technologically backward, but it was able to improve its economic superiority despite its technological backwardness, and then that improved its technological standing. I think, I don't know, I'm trying to give an example. Yeah. Maybe that's not ideal. But they seem to be different things. You can, be, you can have economic freedom and a lack of computers. And you'll, right. you'll get better. Yeah, but it seems like economic freedom will lead to technological improvement. Yeah, it seems like it. So it's a, you know, tech, technology, like knowledge is kind of just like a lagging indicator of economic freedom. Hmm. Right. Well, what if you had a really wealthy economy like Venezuela, but economic inferiority so you've got all this all these um, all this technology but then economic inferiority d just destroyed everything mm -hmm. what is Mises critique of the infant industry argument for tariffs so I guess the Infant industry would be, you know, the United States is trying to get into the, I don't know, what, what's an industry? They're trying to get into the, the, the chip making industry. So, in order to protect that industry, they put tariffs on, you know, foreign computer chips. So, what would Mises argument be against that? It would be I don't see it. Um, yeah, so I mean, I guess his main gripe about tariffs is that it's causing misallocation of capital. If you're, if someone is spending more in the, the United States, spending more money on computer chips because there's a tariff on a Chinese manufacturer versus American, then th there's a misallocation of capital because they're spending more money on computer chips that would have otherwise gone into others' factors of production that the market properly suits. Yeah, and it punishes specialization. Right. How does the degree of convertibility of the supply of cap capital goods affect all decisions concerning production and consumption? How does the degree of convertibility of the supply of capital goods affect all decisions concerning production and consumption? Gee, I don't know. That sounds like a question that has a really straightforward answer, but I, I don't... Hmm.
Well, okay, so for instance, let's say it was really hard for you to get Bitcoin SV because it's listed off of all exchanges. So that's going to affect, you're not going to use it um, as much because it's harder for you to get, harder for you to find. Hmm. And it's harder, yeah, so it's harder con to convert your dollars over your BTC into BSV. So it wouldn't be smart to use it as a factor of production or to consume a lot of it. Hmm, okay. I'm trying to think of another uh, example from Fresh Press. The, their capital goods are things like their smoothie machines and their like refrigerators and their like bananas. Mm -hmm. So, how does the degree of convertibility of those things affect all decisions concerning production and consumption? I think they're like. Well, so like their bananas, they're gonna they're gonna just use them. They they. They're gonna go bad, so they they need to convert them into smoothies. Yeah, they can't just be like, all right, we're just selling bananas now. You want some bananas? We, mm -hmm. Like they don't sell their capital right goods um, because they're less convertible mm -hmm. than a smoothie. Right. And they're not gonna sell their refrigerator. They're gonna use it to make money. It's better for them. Mm -hmm. And I guess because it's less convertible, otherwise it would be just money. Right. Accumulation, maintenance, and consumption of capital. Why is capital a praxeological concept? In what way does it differ from the Marxian notion of capital? Hmm. I would say capital is a praxeological concept without checking the bag, which I think we should still do, is the result of human action. It's the result of, of uh, choice um, involving, so like all human action is about removing a dissatisfaction and discomfort um, and moving up the scale to be more comfortable. So if a human saves with the knowledge that their low time preference will result in more comfort later, then capital is the praxeological result of that decision. Okay, that makes sense. In what way does it differ from the Marxian notion of capital? I would think that, Mar I, and I don't know the answer exactly, but I'm spitballing here. I'm thinking the Marxian notion of capital is just that capital is just this thing that exists. It's like.